Don't you dare turn that dial. Don't you turn this station, because if you do, you're going to miss a really, 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 really good show. Because our guest this evening is Miguel Silva. This is a man who's been chief of staff to the president of Colombia. He's been a journalist. He's had a political consulting firm in South America. He, when he was chief of staff to the president of Colombia, Clinton was coming in. That was the early 90s. In the last 10 years or so, he's been doing politics and public policy in Latin America and South America. Most importantly, he's a fellow at the Institute of Politics at the University of Chicago. You'll find out more about that. Don't you turn that station. Don't you turn that dial. Because if you do, you're going to miss a really, 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 really good show. You're watching Public Affairs. Berkowitz is my name, and politics is our game. And we will be doing lots of politics and public policy this evening because, as I promised, we have as our guest, Miguel Silva. He is the head of your own consulting firm? Yes, I'm a political senior consulting managing director firm. of a political consulting firm. We sold that to an American firm called FTI Consulting. Okay, so you're now part of FTI Consulting. So I'm now part of FTI Consulting. All right. And most importantly, as I said, he is a fellow... We'll talk about that as to what it means, but he's a fellow at the Institute of Politics at the University of Chicago. You can see our surroundings a little different than our tame studio. We're sitting here in a conference room of the second on the second floor of the Institute of Politics, located on 57, at near the corner of 57th and Woodlawn in Hyde Park. David Axelrod is the director of this uh, August institution, and so Miguel, I'll just start out because the most important thing we're probably thinking of. People are focusing a lot on Obamacare as we tape this on December 4th, 2013. They think of foreign policy about Iran and, you know, what was the United States deal a good one? Are we, are we going to be less or more safe in terms of the nuclear capability of Iran? I have to say, I think most people would say the furthest thing from their mind would be the foreign policy or relations of the United States with Latin America. South America, with the exception of immigration and the problems we have or don't have at the border. So do I have that right, and do they have that right, or should people in America be more focused on something you know a great deal about, the relationship between the United States and South America and Latin America? Well, Jeff, first of all, thank you for having me here. I, I'm really glad to be here. Uh, you've been in a couple of my seminars, and uh, you've seen the excitement that uh, talking about Latin America brings on, within students in the University of Chicago, mostly Americans. Um, and, and I think it is because it's a fascinating time in the region. I think Latin America is full of great news. Uh, uh, Latin America has, is full now of success stories. Uh, and, and I think that in U.S.-Latin America relations, something like the prodigal son happens. Uh, because we're the normal ally, because we're there, because, you know, we're part of the, what used to be called in the Cold War, the backyard. Um, when you say we, who are you referring to? Latin America. Latin I mean, America. the Latin American How many allies, countries are in Latin America? Well, they're, the Organization of American States, uh, which uh, unites all of them, including Canada and the U.S., has 34 members. If you add Cuba, which is not a member of, of uh, the OAS, you will find that uh, non-U.S. Canada Americas is about 33 countries. Now, some of them are Anglo-Caribbean. Uh, uh -huh. um, but you're talking about and economies. You're, you're Colombian. I'm Colombian, yes. You're I was born, born in, in Bogota, you're... raised in Bogota. Okay. And I, for example, I'll, I'll start with that example, Jeff. I think it's very interesting. Because the, the, I have lived a life where when I was 30 years old and I was in government, I had bodyguards and a bulletproof uh, car um, and anyone who was trying to be in government was risking his life. Um, this ten, is when you were 30 years was, old? Yeah. At so simply 20 years ago? Yes. The, the Bill Clinton era that yes, started exactly. the Bill Clinton era. Okay. In 2000, I went back. I, 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 went, I came to the States for some years and worked for a political consulting firm. I went to run a magazine and there and then I had a bulletproof car and my wife had a bulletproof car, and my kids could not walk in the streets. Now, 10 years on, to, uh, 2009, 10, 11, 12, 13, you have a country where I walk to the office, my kids walk to school, or not to school because it's far away, but they, but, but they do walk to college, the, the medium. So it's much safer. It's much safer. What's, what happened? What changed? Well, a lot of things happen. I think that there, there has been a big effort of bringing people out of poverty with stronger economies. There has been a huge uh, 
collaborative effort between the U.S. and Colombia. And it's an interesting effort because it's been a bipartisan effort from the U.S. In, and a success story in the war against drugs. Um, the, the, the guerrillas and the cartels have been either completely eliminated or weakened. There's an ongoing peace process with the last guerrilla in Colombia. Um, now you have booming cities and you have 5% growth every year. Two years ago, one year ago, the Wall Street Journal voted on Medellin as the world's most innovative city in the world against Tel Aviv and Sydney. Oh, okay. uh, and if you go there, I mean, 20 years ago, you, you could not say, and this was a colleague of mine who's running the Center for Latin America, the Atlantic Council, used this, this line today in the seminar. He said, you know, 20 years ago, you could not say the word Medellin without the word cartel, and now you cannot right. say the word Medellin without the word success. So there's no main cartel. Without the word, no. That cartel no. is gone. No, the main cartels today are in, in Mexico. Colombia does play, uh, unfortunately, uh, a, a role in, in, in that chain. But I think as time goes by, that will be less the case. But, but I think my point here was uh, there's excitement to find in Latin America. Brazil is a booming economy. Brazil is uh, the sixth or seventh economy in the world. Uh, Mexico is the 14th economy in the world. Uh, Venezuela, uh, Colombia and uh, Argentina are 26 and 30. Um, so so these, suddenly, are, these are a block of countries that there's some affinity with in terms of what democracy and also much friendlier to the West, or done that the West, much friendlier to the United States. Would you well, say? Yes. Would you say that Brazil? Would yeah. they be in that category? Yes. yes. Argentina, Very Colombia. What else? What I'll, I'll differentiate a little bit because I think you have 570 million people in Latin America which are Western and share the same beliefs that, that the Americans have. So suddenly, you, I mean, you have a neighborhood that's energy rich uh, and that shares your main values. Now, having said that, there, I would say, at least two big divided dividing blocks in Latin America. Okay. One is clearly U.S. ally clearly uh, free traders, clearly pro-democracy uh, with own uh, checks and balances in their power systems. Mexico, Colombia, Peru, Chile. That's the new alliance for the Pacific. But they're so not only... Again, what are they? Mexico, Mexico Colombia. Colombia, Peru, and Chile. And Argentina, you don't put in there? No. So these four signed an alliance that will not only be free trade, that's easier, um, it, it going, it, it's going to mean the free movement of people among those it's four something countries. Something like the European Union. S exactly. Okay. So, for example, they're going to share embassies in, in Africa. You will have countries of Africa where, where you will not have a Mexican embassy or a Chilean embassy or a Peruvian embassy or a Colombian embassy. You will have a Pacific Alliance embassy. Uh, and the ambassador could be Mexican or Colombian. Okay. Uh, or in Ivory Coast, or in, and so that's one block. Then you have another block that's the, the Alba countries, which are not necessarily so pro-democratic. Alba countries. Yeah, the uh, why, Venezuela, why Alba? the Alianza Bolivariana. Okay. It's Chavez. It's a Chavez okay. invention, and it's it's basically Venezuela, Venezuela driven, Venezuela finance, Venezuela craziness, uh, moving right. it. Um, it's Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua. Um, Bolivia, Ecuador, and Argentina. And, I'm, well, I'm not sure if Argentina is uh, a member of ALBA. It is a member of the Mercosur Alliance. So, so you do have clear blocks. And do those um, countries all tend to tilt left in terms of yes. being more socialistic, less yes. capitalistic? Yes. It's what okay. you could call a new populism, new wave of populism. They differ, be they differ where, where between each other. Also. You didn't put them in either so block. So Brazil is an interesting case, Jeff, because Brazil... Brazil is playing like now China is, is, is looking for it, their role in the, in the, in the, as, as a global player. You see Petrobras... Well, recently named to do the Olympics in what year? Uh, well, it's they do up. the Olympics and the World Cup, the uh, soccer year, World Cup year, uh, we'll, next year. Is it next year? Next year is the, the World Cup. And then the I know Olympics. because I'm planning to go. Okay. 
Olympics are 2016. Is that what it is? I, I'm not sure when okay. the Olympics are. But it's coming up. I thought there. it was a soccer. Yeah. <laughs> you do it. Did you bring your soccer ball? <laughs> yeah, you know, you, the soccer ball, well, you lost the soccer ball. Did you lose it? You know, it's around here. We're going to get Miguel back here. You know, okay. one great thing that happened with, with soccer is that uh, the Colombia team is, is uh, in. So I don't know if we're going to win, but uh, we are clearly a part are of the world. Are you a big soccer World player? Cup. I mean, uh, not a big but soccer But it is big. Play. Soccer is big in Latin so America. Soccer is America. huge in South America. Okay. Huge in Latin America. Baseball is, is bigger in the Caribbean, uh, and there are some great Colombian baseball players. We were talking about Brazil, and you're saying Brazil is is sort of trying to find its identity, right? Well, Brazil... Brazil's are they are they are they more capitalist you know, or socialist? Brazil is totally capitalist uh, okay. with two socialist presidents, Lula and Dilma. Uh, but it's very totally socialist. capitalist, even though they have it socialist is, presidents. It is well, mostly. Is, why is that? It is because I think that what they've done is a very aggressive um, public policy of support for the poor with good social okay. programs, but they have kept mostly the market economy. That, that is it a has, democracy. It is a complete democracy. Are all those countries you mentioned before in your the block associated with Colombia, Peru, Chile, Colombia, and Mexico, right? Yes. Are those those are democratic yes. countries? Yes. Democracies. The four of them. Very the other strong. countries are all tend to be less democratic. The other countries, I would say, I, I would take Argentina out. Argentina has had a traditional uh, uh, democracy. It, it, it's they, they run into frequent. Okay waves of populism but in general it's but in general it's very democratic okay. then you have uh venezuela who's completely destroyed all democratic rights of m the minorities Although they in have the opposition. a strong opposition i, I they heard have that a, in a seminar yes, i learned that, that year look folks she should just interrupt to say these seminars are run by the fellows the fellows generally come here for a day or two for 10 six, six successive weeks Okay, but Miguel is a little different. He's been here almost all the time for 10 weeks, a little bit because of the distance going back That's and forth. Correct. It's not like going to Washington. I'm a Hyde Park so, neighbor right. right now. So you've, yes, you've begin, become a Hyde, Hyde Park native in a sense, okay? But these fellows run seminars at least once a week where they meet usually at lunch. Actually, it's great. Uh, and this is open to the public. It's mostly undergrads who will come here. But occasionally you get alumni. You get a lot of uh, of grads, and and it's interesting, Jeff. You get members of the community too. I'll give you an interesting example. When the government shut down, I had a bunch of people from EPA coming to my seminar. Oh, because they had nothing to do. Is they shut it down, <laughs> and and they had some want to do something interesting. Yes, that's but I correct. mean, if they had their choice, if they didn't have to go to work at the EPA every day, they would be here. Yes. they wouldn't be playing soccer, that much as correct. they might like it. They wouldn't be having coffee somewhere. <laughs> they would be coming to a seminar conducted by Miguel Silva, right, well, at the you, Institute Jeff. of Politics at the University of Chicago in Hyde Park. No, but very seriously, folks, these are great programs. I've gone to a number of them. Amy Walter has been uh, from the uh, the national editor of the Cook Political Report. Is a fellow fellow. She's Fantastic. She's come on our show. We've had you on now. We had, um, well, Steve. Um, Steve Edwards. Steve Edwards. We blanked on his name for, for a moment. And Did uh, you interview Robin Carnahan, the former Mr. Secretary yeah. of State of yeah. Missouri? No, but I, I would like to. I she's, did get to see her. She's fantastic. She had, uh, who was the U.S. Senator who was out with Vin her? Weber. No, there's another U.S. senator, Democratic senator, who was at a program. Oh, that was her. probably Tom Daschle. She, mm, uh, no. He was here, too. Oh, but you're a, mentioning all these guest. people. So we're giving you a flavor. of This is happening right here in Hyde Park. And uh, you know, folks should drop in. There are these national, they have national speakers coming. So you have a speakers program, you have a fellows program, and you have an internship program. But back to your story. Back to what you're talking about, these two blocks. So you have the block of... Colombia, Mexico, Peru, and Chile. And Chile, and that block is called. It's called the Pacific Alliance. Pacific Alliance. So, and that's Which how is, long has that existed? No, it's starting, Just and now. it's and it's okay. more a process than it is a reality. It it it's signed, but a lot of things have to happen on uh, until there is free movement of peoples among. And how those does it interact countries. with it's the two, United 200 States? Two hundred million people. Can you imagine? And how does it interact with you? How does that I, affect the I, United States? I think I think it it I think. The, the point there, it's, it's a huge opportunity for the United States. For trading? Because for, not only for trading, I think the United States should promote success stories in the region. I think the United States should do what it's starting to do, which is treat the Latin American countries uh, as, as not equals, but as grown-ups. As peers. 
as peers and have more construct constructive conversations, the, the United States co could completely change, for example, its energy balance if it were more uh, constructive with Latin America. It could have m most of its resources coming from the region. I mean, there, there, there's there's enormous opportunity there. I think for what Americans. What, what, there. what specifically, if you were king, and you could say to either the Barack Obama president or the Congress, the House or the Senate, what would you advise them to do to implement what you're talking about? Well, what, the first thing is, I I would say, you're you're too worried in the urgent, which you should, of course. I mean, Pakistan and Syria and Iran. That's that's the urgent, but but deal with the urgent, but start looking at what's also important. Uh, you have 570 million people that look up to the United States in South America and in Latin, in Latin America. America, and if you poll all around Latin America, even in those countries where the government is anti-American, people, the people, the citizens are pro-American. They are why. What is it about? Because them? because the America because the U.S. has has had enormous influence in in as a culture, and you and of course there's television, there's movies, but there's also the news. I mean, we're in the we're in the orbit of the empire. I mean, we're in the orbit. It's like when the Roman Empire and you have Judea or Antioquia or you know we're in the orbit. We're there. We 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 share the beliefs. The main beliefs we share, the U.S. and Latin America share the beliefs of the power of the, of, of the people, the government by the people, that, you know, minorities have rights. And, and so what does it do with these other countries, this block that's less friendly? That's interesting. What's the name of that block again? It's Alba. Okay. Alba. I, I, and there's, you know, Alba there, there are a couple, a couple of other ideas this coming up. This is Venezuela. Up, this is Ecuador. That's Venezuela, Ecuador, Nicaragua, Cuba. Uh, Bolivia. Those are the most important can, ones. Can the United States do anything with Venezuela? Can well, it help? The, there is, as we, as I mentioned in a seminar you were conducting, I learned about the opposition in Venezuela it has come very close in some elections. One point five percent. Right. I don't think people Margin. realize that. So this this autocratic regime of first Hugo Chavez and now his brother is that right? Nicolas Maduro. No. But uh, uh, but a, colleague. a friend of his Sorry. brother. <laughs> right. A friend of his brother. They 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 almost got mm. toppled. So could the United States do anything, or would they, well, could they get involved in helping topple them, or would that be counterproductive? I think I think the United States has to uh, has to build bridges with the people of Latin America. Besides dealing with the governments of Latin America, the people. Well, how do they do that? With the people. Well, I, I think there there are many ways to do it. I think there there are many ways of of promoting friendship between countries, of promoting um, investment and information and education exchanges and scholarships and, you know, a lot and, of... And they can still do this with the ALBA countries, even yes. though they're hostile yes. to the United States. Yes. The now, governments are hostile. In political terms, aren't. at times, it's good that the United States doesn't do anything. Because when the states, for example, would say, we like the opposition in Venezuela because they're they are democratic. The government is not democratic. It'll hurt the opposition. But what it will about, not help the but opposition. What about you know? There's a lack of freedom in these countries. We have the technology. We used to have radio free Europe. So when we had these iron curtain, iron curtain countries in Eastern Europe, which were dominated by the old Soviet Union, we could bust through there. Yeah. We had radio free Europe. We could give these people news. Radio free Europe was not looked at as biased propaganda from the United States. It was looked at as balanced news. Well, could we do something like that? Radio I, 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 don't think, I don't think. I don't think that. Or is that not, not needed? I don't think. Do you, well, these, first of all, does I don't Venezuela think it, have yes. a free press? I don't think so, right? Well, it's a two questions. Yeah. So, so, so one: Does Venezuela have a free press? Right. It has a free press, but the government has taken over most of the electronic media outlets. Well, how can it be free if they've taken it? Well, uh, some of them are not government owned, oh, okay. so they. You know what these guys do? That's that's a problem, which is. They, they keep some of the free press. Or in Ecuador, for example, the press is supposedly free, but laws uh, against uh, the freedom of expression... They put people uh, in jail. They put people in jail, yes, or they, or they okay. find people. So there, there are different ways of asking. So how can we, how can, they, fix how can the United States help make that press, well, I think, press I think more free? I'll, I'll give countries. you a couple of examples. One, I think there's a big role for countries like the States or the European Union 
or even the Pacific Alliance to strengthen civil society all across Latin America. Because it's civil society, the one that's going to change that circumstance. It's not going to be an AWOC plane with, uh, a, a, with emissions of uh, news programs in a um, um, Spanish with you as accent. So what do they do to strengthen <laughs> civil society? I, I think there are many ways to strengthen civil society. There are many organizations in civil society from unions and you know teachers and students. Uh, students, for example, in Venezuela have been critical in, in strengthening the opposition, critical in putting some limits to what the government wants to do, critical in defeating the government in certain referendums. But what I keep on trying to understand is what can the United States Congress, President, or non-government organizations, NGOs, what can they do specifically? I understand you're saying there are these oh. opposition groups, there are students, but what can the United States... Yeah, and but, you're, but Jeff, do? you're looking for a good uh, answer on a unilateral act. And I, I don't think that's the way. I think there used to be the organization of the American states that has this in, in uh, the, the charter the democratic charter of the uh, of the americas and and that used to work uh, i think it, it's proven to be useless now the the organization the american the the organization of american states or the or the americas hemisphere as a whole has to find ways in which the collectivity not the us can point out to those countries that are uh, on the offside and can say that is a moment where you're not uh, protecting the rights of the minorities, th you're crossing the line. That is unacceptable. And to have some, I don't know, trade sanctions, but collectively, so when you do it unilaterally... part of the OAS or, or help it, with, it is or part of with the, the Pacific Alliance? I, I you're think saying that's the way. multilaterally. I think the way is to act multilaterally. That has proven it's, it's sometimes very difficult, but I, I think it's proven to work and to have a uh, longer effect rather than unilateral acts. But, but I think, I, I, don't, I don't want us to lose like the, the, the picture because I think Latin America in general is a success story right now. It's a good story. 50 to 70 million people have uh, come out of poverty in the last decade. Most of the countries are growing three, four, five percent per year, which is not the <clears> case <throat> in Europe and it's not the case here. Right, two percent. Uh, yeah, most yeah. of the countries have inflation of one, two, three percent. Most of the countries have unemployment of seven, eight percent. I mean, we're talking... So you're uh, talking most countries, not just the Pacific Alliance. You're saying Latin America, South America, and now has a stable... Most of the countries have stable growing economies. Yes. Their median income is still quite a bit less yes. than the United States. Yes. But the growth rate in those countries, the economic growth yes. rate... Yes, there are is exceeding many the which States are an exception, Europe. but the bigger countries are doing fairly well. And what, what, to what do you attribute that? Because that wasn't the case 20 or 30 years ago. Well, I, I, think, I think we were all pretty shielded from the global crisis. We were not shielded in the sense that our biggest buyers were hurt. And if your buyers are hurt, you're hurt. You're hurt. But we were shielded because our financial sectors were not involved in the subprime crisis. Right. We did not have that. What are, we we well, did not have those bit, toxic what assets. Are the, what are the... What are the uh, financial sectors like that are doing well? I mean, you mentioned the number of airplanes that are sold out of Brazil, is that right? Yeah, well, it's an interesting story. You know, if you, if you, if you fly an airplane in the U.S., uh, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm stealing these examples from my dear friend Peter Schechter from uh, the Latin American Center at the Atlantic Council, and who I was, heard who that who, who was today, in the seminar today. Seminar just today, and, and it's December fascinating 4th. examples. Right. If you if you fly, if you in the states and you fly less than three hundred miles, there's a seven to one chance that you're flying a Brazilian made plane, right. Embraer. Um, in the last forty years, the largest investment in steel, six point nine billion dollars, has been from an Argentine uh, steel company called Tequint. Um, and there, there are a bunch of, 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 of good examples uh, like that. Um, Is this know, a reflection of the free market? Are these countries yes. that are doing well? It's, it's also a reflection. Are you a believer in the free market? Oh, yes. Okay. And why are you believing in the free market? Well, because I think, I, I, I think, that, uh, I think that there's good, good evidence that when the government is all over the place, Men getting involved in the economy, uh, it doesn't work. 
So you know this guy. Let's put that up if we can get that. I know that guy. Free to Choose by Milton and Rose Friedman. He's kind of an icon. He, of course, he's yes. deceased now, but he was dominant. Well, he was probably the most important economist, Milton Friedman, in the, in the 20th century. Don't you think? Yes, but I have one. Not and, and that book was, of course, Free to Choose. Do you believe in Free to Choose? Yes, definitely. But, okay. but I have a caveat on the, on the, on the Friedman, yeah. Friedman U Chicago thing. And, and it, this is the following. I think that in Latin America, the state plays a very important role, very important role in the protection of the poorest. Um, and it has to have, because we still, I'll give you an example, in, in not to talk about Mexico and Brazil, the largest countries in population. Colombia, 45 million people. We've been extremely successful in, in, in we, we, had, we had, I don't know, 40, 50% of people below the poverty line. We now have 14% of people below the poverty in line. In Colombia? Yes. Millions of people have gone out of the poverty line in the last five to ten years. Economic mobility up? Yes. And the, well, Millions. That, that's a free market example. Now, if you, Isn't yeah, that a and, free market and example? And it is. But now... In, 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 I would say, it if is. you look no, at no. socialist countries, you don't have that kind of economic True. mobility. Yes. Okay. And, but you still have 14% of 45 million people. Well, you, is, you, and so you, as you point out, you so want you to assist have, people who yes, are low income exactly. and help them elevate themselves, work with them exactly. so they can escape poverty. So I do, this guy, one thing I'll say, you know, people don't realize, Milton Friedman had the idea of the negative income tax. So instead of having a vast welfare program, if your income is low or non-existent, just like you fill out on a, he would have you fill out on a postcard, a very simple thing, to pay your taxes, fill out on a postcard, you have no income and the government will send you money. Because he thought, although people, people, that's how you instill growth in them. You rely on them to make good choices. Yes. You don't, yes, some will make bad choices. So Friedman was a big believer in assisting low income people and treating them with dignity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, in a, in a strange way, some countries do that. But, uh, but I, I, I wonder, you know, direct subsidies to people in that way n end up creating a, politic uh, a political clientele uh, for Chavez no, you and those guys. You always incentivize, in other words, and, and you, you set structure that. So as they make income, they keep a very large portion of it. We sometimes in the United States have a vast array of programs, food stamps, uh, health care stamps, other stamps. And so when these people find a job, they start paying 70% of their new income to the government. Well, so his idea is incentivize, give people an incentive to get off of the assistance program by always looking at yeah. what do they get marginally by yeah. getting a job. Yeah. I mean, your point was that Latin America is growing rapidly. Yes. The economies are doing well. Yes. And I simply interjected, and in, in, I think in a significant part from also being at your seminars, I picked up a strong belief in the free market and that the free market in these countries, in Latin and South America, has helped them have high economic growth yes. rates and has helped people escape from poverty. Yes. And you agree with all that? I agree with that. Okay. And basically, I also, I also yeah. believe that the United States has a role to play, given the size of its economy, in helping these countries uh, with free trade and, and that. But, but you also benefit from imports because yes. if you're able to buy products from the United States at lower prices, which, these individuals which benefit. Is the it's case. Not, in yes. fact, people would say, Although it sounds, you don't hear this commonly, but Friedman would tell you it's imports that help countries grow much more than exports. And that's, for example, Colombia signed a free trade agreement with, with the United States exactly because of that. Right. Well, I very much want to thank Miguel Silva. He, of course, as I said, we're as a chief of staff to the president of Colombia. He's been involved in the media. He's, for the last 10 years, been involved in political consulting, had his own firm, now is part of a larger firm. But most importantly, most importantly, for the last 10 weeks, he's been a fellow at the Institute of Politics at the University of Chicago. And everybody, everybody should come down here and visit the Institute of Politics at the University of Chicago. And when you do that, whether you go to a seminar, to a speaker's program, whether you get yourself or your kids involved in internships, you walk up to David Axelrod and you said, Jeff Berkowitz sent you. All right. Thanks <laughs> Thank so you, much, Jeff. Thanks Take, very much. Or Miguel Silva sent you. All right. Come on. When you come back to Chicago, you come back and see I us. I will okay? definitely. Thank, Thank you. you, Jeff. All right.